history that continues to inspire, starting now. Hey, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden Style, a show about ways to grow, cook, and design your world in some unique and fun ways. We're going to take a look at the restoration going on at the Mark Twain house and get some tips you can use at home. Then we'll prepare a dish that's truly classic, the traditional coquevon, the best use of a mean old rooster I've ever found. And later I'll visit with guests at a seed swap to discover how they're working to sustain heirloom plant varieties. I'm so excited about all the things we're going to see in today's show and I'm so happy you're along for the ride. So why don't we get started right after the break. Wow, look at this room. You know, I love a work in progress. This is definitely a work in progress. <laughs> now, just to establish where we are in the house, we're on the first floor, and this would have been a bedroom for non-family members, like visiting authors. Exactly. One of the things that we're working on here is, of course, the wall treatments. Behind some of the woodwork, we found two really small eraser-sized samples of wallpaper. Oh, really? Tiny? Tiny, tiny samples. Oh, my gosh. So we're not exactly sure how much evidence we're going to be able to find from that. Mm -hmm. We're going to do analysis on them and see what we can find. Well, Patty, I think this wallpaper looks very convincing. It feels like the house. It definitely does. It actually has great ties with the Clemens family because the woman who designed it was one, is Candace Wheeler, and she was one of the designers who worked on the interior ah. of this house as well. well. That is quite a connection. Now, this is the, the subfloor, and then you have a higher grade material here. Right. This is actually the Clemens subfloor. So mm -hmm. this is the original subfloor to the house. Sure. and it would have been carpeted. Mm. The family that moved here in 1903 took out the carpeting and then they put in this hardwood floor. Right. All of this hardwood flooring will be removed and what we will be doing is going back to the wall-to-wall -wall strip carpeting that the Clemenses had here originally. So what you can see here are some of the nails and some of these tacks are showing where there was carpet tacks. I so we see. can figure out what the width was for the carpet. And do you have samples of that? Are you having to sort of go by, well, it may have looked like this. We have carpet fibers, so not really enough to consider it actually a sample. We have about four different colors of carpet fibers. So you can get close with color. We can get close with color, and we can get close to see what the materials are made of, so maybe some of them are binding fibers, some mm. of them can tell what kind of a carpet it came from. I see. I guess these are some that have been under consideration. They are. They're, again, it's a period pattern, and but they're made by a modern manufacturer. You can see here where we've actually stripped some of the finish away to mm -hmm. see what the original looked like, and then over here we have a sample where we've been trying out some ideas of how close we can get to different finishes. This house was built in the 1870s and he clearly planned for a place, a getaway, a place for him to play uh, and sort of clear his mind because it was so important to him with his creative work. It was, and he actually thought about that as early as his time in Nevada when he was planning with a friend about how when he made it rich he was going to have a billiard room and it would be up on the top floor of his house. <laughs> so he spent a lot of time thinking about this. <laughs> Very good. So let's just go through some of the things that he thought about that actually made this a very inviting place for the creative process. Right, so of course the biggest element in the room that we'll see here is the billiard table. Right. And so he planned to have this room that was upstairs away from the hubbub of the rest of the household. So removed here on the third floor. Very much. And he not only had a place to play, he had that separated out from his place to work, even though it's within the same room, something that he could step away from right. a little bit from his, from his writing and his editing, gave him a time to clear his head a little bit, and then when that inspiration struck again, he could get back to his So writing. there was the desk where 
he would sit and write, and then there's the billiard table that he would use to play billiards and also use it as kind of a workspace too for sorting out manuscripts. He did. He would often spread out his pages right across the top of the billiard table when he wasn't playing. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. But there are also other aspects of this room as well. I mean, it is removed, but uh, he could step out onto a porch or porches. Yes, there's actually three porches off of the room, but also right off of one of the porches, there used to be a lovely river and you could go outside and have that calming sound nice. that was going. Yeah, that communion with nature. So that was present as well. You know, there's so much we can learn from Mark Twain, given the fact that he was such a literary icon. And I think that in our modern world where life is really very crazy, I think coming to a place like this is a reminder to me that, that play and rest and isolation really does help feed the creative juices and encourage those muses to sort of dance around on your shoulder and whisper in your ear. And it definitely worked for Mark Twain in this room with some of the times that he wrote Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, Connecticut Yankee, all of the great masterpieces oh that we think goodness. of with Mark Twain. Really? Well, thank you so much for the tour here because I think it's so important to, to look at great examples of how creative people created space around them to facilitate their, their works. Thank you so much for coming. My friend Blake Wintori shows us around the historic Lakeport Plantation when we return. Good grief, look at the height of this door. How, how tall is it? It's 10 feet 8 inches. And look at the back over here. Backside we have uh, a new faux grating like the original in Rosewood. Oh my word. Beautiful job on this. Stunning color. And look at the molding in here. This yeah. is quite an entry hall. It is. Almost all that crown molding is original. Now tell me about the floor cloth here, Blake. I'm very interested in these. This was one of our most interesting discoveries during restoration. We found this floor cloth in place still. Uh, was in a corner, so it had the least amount of traffic and damage on I it. I see. It's a gothic pattern. There's 14 colors on that on that canvas. It has a look of carpet, but it's something that's durable for your entryway that you can clean off. And Alan, this is a piece of uh, unpainted uh, floor cloth that it's made out of. Oh, I saw it sitting there. I wondered what it was. This is really thick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you could, it's almost carpet-like in a way. Right. Yeah. And so this would have been painted on just with uh, paints of the day in various shapes and forms and colors, and there were probably all kinds of styles to choose from. Right, they use a woodblock printed method to uh, paint these. So Blake, what's the height of the ceilings in this whole downstairs area? 14 feet uh, throughout most of the house. Actually. Throughout most of the, 14 feet, that's colossal. Yeah, mostly that's designed to help ventilate the house. Yeah, the higher ceilings, hot air rises, so it was help, help cool the place. Right, so they the designed these homes for, for ventilation and cooling. Yeah, well I've noticed some transoms in some of the windows, which would have, I guess, accelerated the, the ventilation or pulling cool air, the venturi effect of the house. Right, some of the back parts of the house you have a transoms above smaller doors, so you can still close the doors for privacy but have ventilation. So this is the master bedroom. I see it has a transom above the door. Does every room have a transom above it here? Yes, all the rooms upstairs have transoms with eight-foot doors. Oh, I see. And these doors are um, have the original faux graining on them. They've uh, they were unchanged, untouched in the 20th century. Beautifully done. I mean, the idea to take some ordinary wood and make it look more rare, like taking oak or pine and turning it into rosewood. Right. With a and it matches of a brush. some of their furniture that they had in the house. So this is some of the original furniture from the family. Right. I just can't get over the size of these doors. It's just amazing. Wow, what a view from up here. In, in 1860, when it was at its peak, it was about 4,000 acres of land. 4,000 acres. With 155 slaves on the planet. Wow, and just looking across there, you can see the cotton is still planted today. It's, it's wow. been harvested, but you can see the stubble. Blake, thank you so much for the tour today. This is really a fantastic place. You're welcome, glad y'all came out. Yeah, my pleasure. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna hang out and just enjoy the view for a few sure. minutes. Sure, yeah. enjoy it. Thanks a lot.
I love it when I can take things here from the farm and put them to good use, delicious use in this case. I wanna show you how I make Cocovan, a classic French recipe that uses, well, a tough old bird. The roosters often would get old and tough and there was always an interest in how one could prepare one of these and Cocovan is a classic. Now what I've done is I've taken a seven and a half pound bird and broken it down. And this took some doing, I'll tell you. I use any sort of tool I can, even my garden pruners to break the bird into eight pieces. And just look at the, the color of the, of the flesh. This is the white meat, look at that breast. This thigh, this is the dark meat there, you see. This is what a heritage bird looks like. Now, these birds uh, are, uh, built stronger than what you would find in the grocery store today. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to break it down and we're going to do this in a number of ways. We're going to brown the chicken before it goes into the slow cooker and then we're going to cook it for a long time and it's so delicious and so tender. And this recipe I break down in two parts. First is the meat part. What I've done here is I've salted and peppered the chicken. I have half of it that is, has been skinned and half of it with the skin still on because I love the flavor of chicken skin and how it makes the Cocovan taste. Then I'm gonna take this bacon and I'm gonna fry it and then we're gonna brown the chicken. That's the meat portion. Then we're gonna move to the vegetable side and then we're gonna assemble it all and put it in the slow cooker. and It'll be done. It's really quite simple, but it does take a little time. In a 12 inch nonstick skillet, cook five strips of bacon that have been cut into small pieces over medium heat until they're brown. Transfer the bacon to paper towels and drain. Next, you want to add the chicken into the hot skillet. Two batches may be necessary and brown over medium high heat for approximately 10 minutes. All right, now with the chicken complete, it's time to prepare the vegetables. And what we use here are celery, onions, carrots, garlic, mushrooms, and some of these little onions. These are some we had drying up in one of the sheds in the garden, so I wanted to put these to use. Some recipes call for little pearl onions, but these were so small and, uh, and beautiful and, and homegrown that I wanted to use them in, in the dish today. Roughly chop three small carrots, two stalks of celery, 16 large button mushrooms, six cloves of garlic, and two medium onions. Now you wanna place these in the bottom of a large slow cooker. Then add your eight pieces of chicken with about 16 whole small yellow onions and then just place that bacon over the top. Then use a bottle of dry red wine to deglaze the pan. This is the skillet that you use. Then add two tablespoons of tomato paste, two dry bay leaves, and nine teaspoons of fresh thyme. Then you want to heat to boiling, stirring to dissolve the tomato paste. This will take a few minutes. All right, with the glaze ready, let's go ahead and pour it over the bird here. Oh, that smells so good. And then we simply top it off with chicken broth. I'm gonna bring it right up to the top. The amount you use will depend on the size of bird you used as well as the size of the container. Now I'll cook this for eight hours on low and the results, well, mouthwatering. It's a great way to use a mean old rooster. Peggy, it's so good to see you again. Well, welcome to Virginia. It's great to have you here. Well, it's just beautiful, and what a beautiful day. You know, I, what I think is so interesting and wonderful about the Thomas Jefferson Center for Historic Plants is that it gives everybody an opportunity to actually have something growing in their garden that, that Thomas Jefferson had growing in his. Exactly. I mean, that, the whole impetus for beginning the uh, Center for Historic Plants was to make actual plants available to people, not just the seeds that we've packaged for years and so we have a nursery we grow plants and have plants on display here and then we offer them for sale at the garden shop at the visitor center as well as through our mail order we have a very thriving mail order operation of course there's a lot of documentation on exactly what jefferson grew at monticello isn't there? that's right he kept a garden diary he wrote hundreds of letters about his gardens. Yeah, Jefferson was quite a naturalist uh, and a botanist, and he grew just about everything. He was a plant nut, and um, he grew all kinds of ornamentals, perennials, uh, shrubs, trees, as well as, of course, the, the vegetables, the fruits. He was very eclectic in that regard. 
Our mission is to get as much out there as we can to get people excited about historic plants, uh, to propagate them and cultivate them and, and preserve them in their own gardens, but it's also helping us. It helps keep these, this living collection alive. Yeah. Well, I'm particularly proud of what you're doing with old roses here in this beautiful example of a old rose garden. It just, yeah, I've just become really inspired to even plant more. Well, I'm so glad to, to hear that because uh, uh, the whole impetus of this garden is to tell the, the story about rose growing in, in America. And Jefferson grew many of these roses that uh, you see here in this garden. They really tell an American story of uh, rose breeding uh, that began in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a, it's a great story that uh, has lots of intrigue and fascination. Well, this is very inspiring, Peggy. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for coming. Have you ever grown American basket flower? No. It grows about this tall, has a big purple bloom on it. It comes from the Arkansas River Valley. Let's swap. <laughs> All right. And I have never seen these. Okay. Huh. Came from my farm. All right. Oh, I'd like to have yeah. Yeah, this is what this looks like. Yeah, that's what I did. It's amazing how time flies. I hope you've enjoyed our step back in time on the show about history. And I hope you've come away with some ideas that will help you grow, cook, and design your world today. For The Garden Style, I'm Alan Smith. Some of the things we have here are quite unique to the site. Um, for example, there is a blackberry lilies that were naturalized at Monticello for uh, decades and they could actually go back to Jefferson's time period and so we've collected seed from that and the ones that we offer to the public are actually propagated from uh, some of the original plants that once stood here on the mountain. That is such a unique plant. I love its little flower and then the black the little seed head is where like, it gets its name. Yeah. Like the blackberry. and. Um, Jefferson called it Chinese Ixia, but it's it's really not a lily and it's not an Ixia. It's it's in the in, it's in the Iris tribe. So, again, those common names kind of throw you off. But uh, it's a wonderful plant from China, and uh, so even though people often think it's native in this part of Virginia because it's it's naturalized. <laughs>